Abu. Abu. All right, we would like to thank everyone for coming out today for our second uh, seminar of the Thursday, the weekly Thursday seminar series. Today we have a very special presentation from Dr. Richard Asante entitled Workable or Unworkable. And today he will be discussing the proposal for uh, the president to be able to select uh, cabinet ministers from outside. Too much. <laughs> Good morning, folks. Once again, you are welcome to this uh, seminar. This is going to be very important, very interesting, maybe just as exciting as it was last week. Uh, but I have told you my name and uh, what I do here. You come in Kruma and out chair in African studies. By training, I'm a historian. I talked with Richard as a political scientist. We share the same value. I will serve one time in my life as chair of the Department of History of Political Science at Albany State University in the US. So when he asked me to chair this, I said, yeah, that's fine. I'm not a political scientist, but we only think the only discipline in existence in the whole world is history anyway. So. <laughs> Richard has a very exciting topic. I'm not going to waste time to talk about it. For me, it's about governance in Africa and using Ghana as a case study to look at it. At the end of the presentation, we may have a lot of questions and answers. Is it democracy betrayal? Is it democracy or hypocrisy? So Richard is going to address all these issues and we take very careful notes so we find out where we're going in this country and in this continent. So without any further ado, let me present to you the Honorable <laughs> Okay, Richard Asante. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chair, and also to my good friend, uh, the Obikotos uh, Obadele, for this uh, opportunity to shed some light on what I consider as a very important you know, development that is emerging in our country. Um, in 2010, um, the late uh, President Atamos appointed a commission to review Ghana's 1992 constitution and also to propose amendments. Um, the process has been underway for quite some time now, but there is one thing that could not pass you know, on notice. One of the most contentious issues has to do with appointment of ministers, either from within or without. The debate has been very exciting and I've been following it quite closely. Um, from different perspectives. On the one hand, there are those who think that uh, the president should be given the free hand to appoint his ministers from outside. And they believe that it's a good thing. There are others who also disagree quite sharply, describing it as a mere academic exercise, it's theoretical, and uh, will rather undermine Ghana's democracy. I have been observing this development very, very closely and um, want to share some thoughts on this uh, issue. My presentation this morning is purely work in progress. Uh, just last night, 8 p.m., I was out there doing some interviews, and so you can just imagine. Uh, the topic itself I, is still, you know, um, work in progress, uh, not attractive enough. I would want to uh, sharpen it a bit. The questions, set of ideas that I have also not sharp enough, would be glad to um, have it sharpened. And also, if you could help me, you know, with uh, appropriate methodologies uh, for me to approach this work, that would be um, very exciting. Um, I want to start off um, with a very powerful statement, a uh, statement uh, credited to Thomas Jefferson, which is in respect of constitutional uh, uh, reforms. And if I have your permission, I will go ahead and quote. Some men look at constitutions with sanctimonious reverence and deem them like the Ark of the Covenant, too sacred to be touched. They ascribe to the men of the preceding age a wisdom more than human and suppose what they did to be beyond amendments. I am certainly not an advocate of frequent and untried changes in laws and constitutions. 
I think moderate imperfections had better uh, be born with because when once know, we accommodate ourselves to them and find practical means of correcting their ill effects. But I know also that laws and institutions must go hand in hand with the progress of humankind. As that becomes more developed, more enlightened, and as new discoveries are made, new truths disclose, and manners and opinions change with change of constitution. Institutions must advance also and keep pace with the times. A powerful statement by Thomas Jefferson, founding father, author of the Declaration of Independence 1776, and the third president of the United States of America. So, um, in the context of this debate, there are those who disagree, uh, claiming that you know we need more time to study the Constitution before making some adjustments. Uh, but I think uh, Jefferson speaks it all that we don't need to be afraid to temper with the Constitution. It is, after all, not the act of the government. The second um, quotation I want to put is uh, In politics with weak legislatures, Democrats should make constitutional um, reforms to strengthen the legislature, a top priority. This credited to Mark uh, uh, Fish. Now, in comparative politics, there is a growing um, discussion and recognition about the links between institutions and, and democratic governance. Increasingly, it is recognized that institutions matter for political development. And according to Maywell 1993, political institutions do matter because they create incentives and, ident and disincentives for political actors, shape actors' identities, establish the context in which policy making occurs and help or hinder in the construction of democratic uh, uh, regime. So basically what he says is that when you have strong, when you have political institutions, they can make or make democracy. But by far one of the most important institutions that has been identified as being a major driver of democratization is parliament, politicians in Ghana. One of the quickest ways for Ghana to climb up the ladder of democratic excellence is to strengthen its parliament. Neither civil society pressures nor random opinioting in the media can never replace a well-functioning parliament as the bulwark of people's uh, control over executive power." Um, unquote. Now, recent comparat the comparative literature clearly shows that strong um, legislatures matter for democracy. According to Steve Fish, if you have strong legislatures, then you have strong um, um, democracy and vice versa. Um, more recent study by Balkan and his colleagues, you know, involving six countries in Africa, Ghana, Uganda, South Africa, uh, Kenya, Benin, and Mali, really shows that in Africa, um, parliament is uh, becoming an important player. As you may recall, in light of the political instability in Africa over the past, uh, one of the key institutions that became a casualty during military coup is parliament. It became a common place to hear things like parliament is disbanded. But since 1992, with the wave of democratization, parliament has been uh, developing in many African countries. It's becoming a major player. Nevertheless, the progress across Africa is uneven. In some countries, parliament you know, uh, has been strengthened, but in other countries, become weak. Um, the work by Balkan and his colleagues uh, shows that in Africa overall, even though parliament is beginning to matter, nevertheless it is weak in many uh, countries. In his volume, in that very same book, Stephen, Stefan Lindbergh wondered why Ghana, in spite of the progress that it has achieved over the years, continue to have a very weak uh, uh, parliament. So the literature says if you have strong democracies, then you are likely to have strong parliament. And if you also have strong parliament, you are also likely to have uh, strong democracies. So how do we then explain growth in democracy in Ghana, uh, yet weak parliament? Apart from Limbeck's work, there are several other studies, Jimabwedi, Prempe, Ninsin, and so on and so forth. All of them point to one thing, that our parliament is 
the weakest link in our democratization. So the question then is, why do, how do we explain this historical puzzle of a country that appears to be doing well, that is described as political success story, achieve political stability, yet is characterized with weak parliament? Other questions that emerge from this is, um, does parliament serve as a check on the executive? Does it really matter if ministers are selected from outside or inside? How can Ghana strengthen its legislature to effectively undertake these oversight uh, responsibilities? Now, in the literature, several scholars have cited one specific uh, provision as responsible for the weakness of parliament. In that provision specifically is Article 78.1, which enjoins the president to appoint majority of his ministers from among members of parliament. Now, now the consequences of that provision is what I have captured in this diagram. I have been observing very closely for quite some time on the relationship between the executive and the, legis and the legislature and uh, what I consider as extremely very, very complicated relationship than previously recognized in other studies. I will attempt to quickly go over this. Now, my story is very simple. There are two groups of politicians. One is the executive, one is the legislature. They operate at two different levels, thanks to Article 78.1. At level A, we are told that uh, they operate on the basis of separation of powers, executive powers given to the president, and then legislative powers given to uh, the legislature. So these are the two separate uh, uh, group of politicians. With this separation of powers, the advantage is that there will be democratic equality. Neither a nor B, neither the executive nor parliament is expected to dominate each other. That is in our constitution. Now, with the separation of power, it is assumed that when the executive powers and legislative powers are separated, it will lead to efficiency, constitutionalism, and democracy. Um, and that is precisely what Baron Montesquieu says, that it is always important to separate uh, powers among the three arms of government executive, legislature, and parliament. According to Baron Montesquieu, it is very dangerous to concentrate powers in one man, either the executive, legislature, or the judiciary. Because when you do that, then the liberty of the people will be denied. And worst of all, you lose everything, right, when you concentrate power in one man. So it is always important to separate powers. And when you do that, then it will lead to efficiency, constitutionalism, and democracy. So that is what the first level of our constitution says. But the same constitution also at the second level says that, well, it is not good enough to have this you know, separation. There should be some convergence at some point. And that is precisely what Article 78.1 does, that there should be some fusion between the executive and the legislature. It is assumed that when you have that fusion, it will strengthen the sanity between the two parties. It will lead to consensus, to the reconciliation, and ultimately, it will be good for society. Is that really what is happening? So at one level, there is separation of powers. At another level, there is a, 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 a fusion of powers, full of contradiction, ambiguity. And that has produced all kinds of things. So, at the left side, we have an executive um, who appoints, uh, who has such vast appointive powers. And uh, you, it might surprise you to know that the president of Ghana wields more powers than the prime minister of the UK. The president has, his powers are just a legend. And it goes, it corresponds with excessive patronage powers with respect to his appointment. Now, if you look at parliament, there are two groups in parliament. We have the majority and minority. In the majority group, there are two groups. There are those who serve as ministers and those who are not ministers. Those who serve, so the president appoints majority um, of his ministers from the majority group. 
some of the appointments could be ministerial appointment, it could be boards, it could be ambassadorial, and so on and so forth. Precisely, the president of Ghana has vast <coughs> appointive powers. National level, ministers, decentralized, the decentralized level, you know, and, and, and so on and so forth. Now, what happened is that because he appoints majority of his ministers from among members of parliament, you will now begin to have a parliament that is comprised of ministers, non-ministers, and minority. And in theory, parliament, you know, is expected to perform oversight and investigative uh, over the uh, issues over the presidency. So the person who is to perform those investigations is precisely also with you in cabinet. The consequences that you have in theory is that the so-called consensus efficiency and conciliation does not happen, but rather it will lead to um, um, parliament becoming weaker and the ultimate thing is that society um, becomes also a loser. Then you have uh, corruption, you have morphisms, conflict of interest, and so on and so forth, and waste in society. This is precisely what um, the new proposal is meant to address. That instead of appointing um, ministers, majority of ministers from among members of parliament, and in which they will not be able to exercise their oversight responsibilities, let's give the president the free hand to appoint people from anywhere. But that does not address the fundamental uh, question. That proposal itself is fraught with a lot of ambiguity itself. Uh, first of all, um, he should appoint from outside. There are a number of options. One option is that the current um, majority from <coughs> parliament, is, the public is saying it's not good enough. So the president has a number of options. He can decide to retain the same formula that our appoint majority, 50, more than 50% from parliament. Or he could say, well, you know, I will appoint 50-50 from parliament. Or he could say, well, you know what, I want to appoint all ministers from outside parliament. Or he could say, well, I want to appoint all my ministers from among members of parliament. Or he could say, well, you know what, I want to appoint all my ministers from outside Ghana. Or he could say that, well, you know, I want to appoint uh, a part from Ghana and also uh, part from outside uh, Ghana. The, what will be the implication of this new formula for the oversight and accountability functions of parliament? It is important for us to recognize that parliament is the house you know, mandated to ensure oversight and accountability vis-a-vis -vis the executive. The 1992 constitution envisaged this, and Article 1031 uh, provides parliament shall appoint standing committees and other committees as may be necessary for the effective discharge of its function. Article 103, uh, 103 plus 3 says, committees of parliament shall be charged with such functions, including the investigation and inquiry into the activities and administration of ministries and departments, as the parliament may determine. And such investigations and inquiries may extend to proposals for legislation. Under Article um, 103, Clause 6, such committee is so important that it has the power, right, and privileges of a high court. It has the power to enforce the attendance of witnesses and examine them on both. It can compel the production of documents and issues, and issue a commission or request to examine witness abroad. So really, our parliament has substantial powers to do its work. So how do we explain the fact that it is unable to you know, perform its um, um, uh, investigative functions? Michael O'Quay says that um, parliament is a house of inquisition. In other words, parliament has inquisitorial powers, which means that it has that power to investigate and perform other oversight responsibilities. Under the current constitution, is parliament able to do that? My answer is no. It is not able to do that because you have ministers, simultaneous parliamentarians serving as ministers. These MP ministers simultaneously, you know, are with um, in the house and also with the cabinet. Now, these guys tend to have very, very busy schedules. Ministers are pretty busy people. 
And so the consequences is that very often our absentees is very high in parliament. Again, these guys are so busy that they are unable to attend uh, committee meetings, and committee meetings are extremely important. Now, at the same time, these guys sit with the president, initiate policies program, and they have to go to parliament to defend it. And according to Michael Quay, when, he, when he, his party was in opposition, uh, he used to grill other ministers. Now, when his, his party came to governance, and when he was appointed a minister and was also serving as a parliamentarian, he never, never posed a question to any of his colleagues who showed up. Because of the whole concept of principle of collective responsibility, we sit with the president, we initiate the votes, we do everything, you have to go to parliament to then defend it. So that is also one of the major uh, issues um, at, at play. So really, what is happening is that because they play that dual role, uh, they are unable to exercise that, you know, inquisitorial functions effectively. They are absent mostly from the House. And the evidence also emerging from Parliament also reveals that, uh, indeed, those MP ministers hardly ask questions. A lot of the questions that they may ask will be constituency issues, but not precisely over what is happening. So it is expected that the new proposal that will give the free hand to the president to appoint his ministers from outside may help. But how? Because the options are so uh, varied. Now, so some civil society organizations are you know, pushing that the president should adopt the extreme option, which is that, well, you know, even though I have free hand and I can appoint from anywhere, I want to appoint all my ministers from outside. The thinking is that when the pres if the president decides to do that, then the first level that I showed previously would work. It would be based on the principle of separation of powers. And the separation of powers ultimately will mean that parliament will now begin to have the autonomy, the independence, you know, to exercise its inquisitorial functions. Um, it will also help the executive uh, to go ahead with his uh, ministerial appointment but that second level, where there is that fusion, where there is that convergence, uh, which is creating all the contradictions and ambiguities and all and so on and so forth, will be uh, 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 done away. So in other words, parliament is detached from, uh, 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 from the executive. What that is going to be is that more autonomy, um, and with more autonomy and independence, parliament will be able to assert its authority with respect to exercise of inquisitorial functions. The ultimate is that it will also reduce the bipartisanship. It will rather promote bipartisanship and not that level of excessive partisanship that um, often leads to walk away boycott in parliament. And if parliament is strengthened, becomes stronger, and they could speak with one voice, then the ultimate thing is that society will benefit because the morphisance, the waste, the inefficiency, and all that has you know, characterize our society will be dealt with. So that is that is the thinking that um, um, many people are proposed. But there are others who disagree strongly. And a lot of these guys are in parliament. They feel that the president should not, you know, uh, appoint ministers, all ministers from outside parliament. Rather, the president should consider appointing all ministers from parliament. You know, this is ridiculous. Because if the president does that, then there is going to be disaster. It is rather going to perpetuate the old system, which has you know, um, uh, undermined parliament and not giving parliament enough space uh, to perform its functions. Now, granted that this separation is granted, um, is, 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 is accepted by the president, what we're going to have is that we're going to have straight separation of powers, as it happened in 1979. So it is actually, after all, not new. 1979, we had that uh, separation of powers where you know the president appointed all ministers from outside parliament. Now, something happened when uh, the then uh, Minister of Finance, our own uh, Professor uh, Bennett, um, as Minister of Finance, delivered his budget, which was uh, um, uh, rejected by parliament. Um, that is quite significant because parliament said, well, even though you know, we have the majority in Parliament. This budget is not good enough, so go back and, and, and rework on it. 
indeed, um, the Minister of Finance at that time did that, brought the, parliament, brought the budget back to Parliament, and it was endorsed. But that created, you know, a fertile ground for people to argue that the government was, the government, you know, the Lehman government was weak and consequently, you know, led to political instability when it was overthrown. So this thought is also a, a part of it. But my own position is that that event was a very sad one because it demonstrated that our parliament in 79 was, after all, gaining teeth to bite. And if they could, a whole ma your own party, which is the majority in parliament, could reject your, pallet, uh, your, your budget and ask you to go and work on it, then we should have you know, uh, carried that system uh, uh, to go. So there are that excuse that these ministers are, are, are given. My, and my position is that it's untenable. We can still go ahead and appoint majority of uh, ministers from outside parliament, 100%. And it will be better off because then parliament will have the autonomy, it will have the strength, it will be able to exercise its independence and the oversight responsibilities. Uh, the committee systems will work very well. There will be efficiency because that one collective uh, uh, principle of collective responsibility is no longer binding on them. Parliamentarians will be able to vote, you know, uh, based on their own line. The party groups can continue to do their job, but ultimately uh, um, they will have a bigger uh, voice and, and independence uh, to do uh, their work. So my main argument is that I am uh, in favor of um, the proposal that majority of ministers should be appointed from outside parliament because I believe that it will help uh, strengthen our parliament. Parliament will be able to gain teeth, will be able to uh, bite, they will be able to work uh, closely and the ultimate thing is that society um, uh, will, will benefit. Now, if that is done, granted that majority president appoints all his ministers from outside parliament, then it will the situation where MPs lead, control, and influence other MPs on the majority side will be dealt with. It will also mean that this time around, MPs will try to catch the eye of the speaker and not the president. Under the prevailing constitutional arrangement, what happened is that a lot of the MPs <coughs> on the majority side in Parliament always want to catch the eye of the President in order to be given a ministerial appointment because ministerial appointment is, re is regarded as promotion. Ministerial appointment also determines where you sit in Parliament. So, um, ordinarily you will be sitting at the back. Once the President you know, um, gives you ministerial appointment, you move to the front seat. And the moment he sacks you, you move back to the seat. Can you imagine, you know, the, the, you know, the, the, the embarrassment? And, and I'm sure uh, that there are a lot of parliamentarians who have suffered that. They were once moved forward, you know, and once taken back, you know, the emotional, psychological impact would never make some of them uh, very good um, ministers. Um, Dr. Kumbo has a famous, you know, statement which I have here. And he accused that the new MPs in the minority side tend to do very well. They are very committed to the parliamentary processes uh, than the new MPs in the majority side. Because he says that for the new MPs, all that they do is that they spend a lot of time parading uh, you know, uh, the, the presidency, lobbying for ministerial appointment, and you know, other you know, appointment to boards of cooperation and so on and so forth. So in the end, some of them don't even see them. So Kumbo believed that those, um, because they spend a lot of time seeking for, you know, political appointment, doesn't help them uh, to be career MPs. Um, then again, also, it will help the politicians uh, to decide whether you want to pursue um, a parliamentary career or you want to pursue other, you know, uh, ministerial uh, career. Um, because in the U.S., for example, um, um, appointments, you know, you, a lot more appointments depends on the record of the parliamentarian, you know. But here it's not so much about your uh, record as a good parliamentarian. It could be a, a good parliamentarian, never will be appointed, a, 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 never given a ministerial position. Uh, you could be a terrible parliamentarian, but you could earn um, um, a, a parliamentary, uh, a ministerial uh, position. Now, you know, when ministers are wholly appointed from outside of parliament, then 
they will be they will have more time, you know, to concentrate on, on their ministerial on, on their parliamentary work. Uh, they will be able to participate actively during question time, uh, at, uh, participate during committees time, uh, committee meetings, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, uh, the kind of legislation that is done will be uh, strengthened. But also, it will also have to minimize the conflict of interest because uh, at the ministerial level, you know, um, go through some uh, procurement processes in which uh, at some levels they have a say, and then uh, when there are issues, you come and sit at the committee level, which is precisely uh, set up to investigate you know, uh, issues con concerning that ministry and department. And uh, Honorable Kumbo actually uh, kicks against that. He thinks that ministers should not even uh, double in those uh, kinds of things, which will end them um, 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 uh, uh, swelling their hands and ultimately uh, destroying their potentials. So, um, in short, I am all for the proposal that majority uh, president appoints all ministers from outside parliament. I believe that it will strengthen uh, separation of powers. And uh, when that separation of powers um, is well institutionalized, uh, parliament will no longer be undermined and become poorer. They will have you know, the autonomy, the independence to assert themselves uh, in order to exercise their inquisitorial uh, functions <coughs> and powers. But at the same time, the executive will continue to have these enormous you know, appointive powers and authorities, but then again, will have to be restricted to a certain sphere where that whole kind of contradiction, confusions, uh, would be uh, uh, minimized. Uh, Mr. Chair, thank you very much for the opportunity. I have the, the, the presentation. He's made his analysis of the situation, including his choice, his preferences, and the advantages. Now it's your turn for the action. I'm going to withhold my own question, the big one, whether it's democracy or hypocrisy. All right. We start with you. My name is Sidney Nezai Yusuf. And um, um, congrats for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, my issue has to do with something which came in a uh, halfway or three quarter way through which um, as a historian I consider to be very important for us to look at the history of the 1992 constitution which I know um, the constitution was informed by the various constitutions that we've had the political experience of the time global and then uh, local I mean uh, Ghana and then the personalities involved in the drafting, two, uh, two groups, the experts and then the, the people who, were, who formed the constituent assembly that went into it. I think it's very important uh, we need to uh, be informed about all these ramifications. Uh, there's also the issue of the private members bill and it, came, it manifested itself on the return of the black stars from Brazil. We, we saw that. So all these things, it would be interesting to know how to bring them out. Not only that constitution, uh, the, the law, the aspect of the constitution that you brought up, but there are other things. We should also look at Panama Patel's fight for the Keta Sea Defense uh, Project, which was informed by uh, members of the NDC from the Volta region who feared that uh, if they don't do something, at the end of the day, the region will be wiped out. But at the same time, their party was in power. So what do we do? There's also J.H. Menzel's assertion that even when his party was in opposition, he was, when his party was in government, no, sorry, when his party was in opposition, from time to time, he found his way in the ruling party's uh, 
committee sittings and others to help them work out various uh, proposals before they came to the floor of the uh, house. So all these things I would like or I would suggest, let me do that, well, I would suggest that you look at them and then at the end of the day we come to those reforms and even we, we should go into the mind of the lip of Sam Mills. Why at that time? Why should he decide to uh, constitute a, a, a committee to review the, the constitution? Thank you. Thank you very much for educating us on, on this issue. Now, I was privileged to be a member of a team, international team, that, looked, that worked under the theme Rethinking Institutional Effectiveness in Africa. And we looked, we picked Kenya, Ghana, and Senegal. And we worked with people from various arms of government in each country. The conclusion was that the executive was too strong in Africa. In each country, we came, we, we got that. Now, here we are, you are telling us that the executive should be made stronger. Because he's now going to uh, choose whom he likes, where he likes, outside. How does that help us? And also, I was a member of the Judicial Council. I was quite fascinated that the judiciary was independent. But I was fascinated by the dynamics between the judiciary and the executive. I mean, like uh, budgets. Uh, had to be approved, like uh, even if uh, you chose the appeal court judge, the Supreme Court judges, it had to go end up on the desk of the executive. And so we have the situation for me as a historian, I find it quite complicated. So I'm glad my younger historian has also brought the issue. And we're looking at do we think from behind and come to the present before we move forward. Uh, and so these are issues I want. Aren't you going to make uh, executive stronger than they are in this case? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Prof, and uh, for the interest in this project and also for your question. I want to start with uh, Prof. Yes, Prof, you are right. Um, as I indicated at some point of the presentation, that the president of Ghana wields more power than the Prime Minister uh, uh, Fiuke, uh, precisely because in the UK, um, the Prame Minister is primus inter pares, you know, the first among equals, and he represents the constituency. The moment he loses his seat, his constituent throw him out, he loses his position. At the same time, there is all kinds of conspiracy, and his ministers can conspire against him and he will be thrown out. But he also exercises you know, enormous appointive powers. But there are checks and balances on those appointments. In the UK, they have what we call the former and the non-former one, which is by convention. So uh, major appointments uh, by the president will have to be vetted and reviewed by the Privy Council. And other appointments are actually done by the Queen. So there, there are checks and balances there. And within the US uh, system, I, as I was working towards this project, I then recognized the wisdom of the delegates to the you know, Philadelphia Convention of 1787. When, in their wisdom, after the preamble, they devoted Article 1 to uh, Parliament, to Congress, or Parliament. They made sure Parliament was well taken care of given enormous powers, right, before uh, Article 2 was devoted to the executive. And says that Congress cannot sit the executive through impeachment, but the executive cannot uh, remove uh, uh, Congress. But at the same time also, there are other checks and balances within the US system that even though the president has enormous appointed powers, in terms of military, in terms of Secretary of State, those high-ranking, you know, ambassador and so on and so forth. He requires consent and advice from Congress. 
In the same vein, somebody will say, oh, but Ghana, we also have it. We have the Council of State and the President, a lot of the appointment to key positions, including Ambassadoria, will have to uh, be approved by the Council of State. So, I mean, so what is important here is the extent to which we have other countervailing powers and authority that will enforce the checks and the balances on the executive. And I think that those countervailing power and authority is very weak in our constitution, even though we have some. Um, um, so uh, that, that is the point. And of course, within the US system, uh, committees and senatorial hearings are serious matters that the president himself, you know, uh, appeared before the, uh, senatorial hearings and could be grilled. You know, seriously. I mean, recently the you know the disaster at uh, Libya when the U.S. Uh, embassy was you know attacked, and we saw President Obama appearing before the senatorial hearing committee. It was serious business. Uh, Secretary of State then Clinton also appeared, and uh, she really had a very very difficult time. So what I'm saying is that there should be enough checks and balances within the system to check the executive excessive appointee authority. Those countervailing powers, we have them in our constitution, but it's pretty weak. Um, my colleague, Dr. Yesu, yes, uh, you raised a very important point. Part of my paper section is devoted to the historical background. The present uh, fusion, especially Article 78.1, which says president should appoint majority from parliament, did not occur in a vacuum. You all remember 19, the independent constitution was based on Westminster. Uh, it was something that when the British were living, they just handed over their constitution to us, something that we never identified with. And they told us that we should move with it because that is how they have developed their country. Nkrumah and others rejected it. Um, unfortunately, after Nkrumah was overthrown, uh, we saw the Westminster uh, principle also introduced in 1969. We saw you know, uh, the consequences of that. Because it says that the prime minister, you know, um, should appoint his ministers from among members of parliament. So, and you know, in Africa and including Ghana, there is a tendency for people to vote along ethnic and regional lines. So, herein lies the enigma at that time that we have a prime minister who has majority in parliament and never had a seat, one MP from one region. The consequences is that he gave a ministerial appointment to. Uh, people within parliament, and because he had no seat, uh, he had to uh, 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 um, leave a whole region, which, which was a, a disaster. The consequences was the you know, ethnic tensions and so on and so forth, which contributed to the demise of, of the Second Republic in 1969. So those who put the 1979 constitution together, you know, really did a great job because they looked back and saw that the Westminster system uh, was not good enough. So let's try to appoint ministers from outside parliament. So here, whether you have uh, uh, people from one region or other in the region, uh, in parliament or not, it's, it's not a big issue. The president can go ahead and appoint all people. But because of what happened when Bennett's budget was rejected and ultimately there was instability, when the committee of experts sat to draft the 1992 constitution, and they proposed something really interesting, the split executive. They proposed that there should be a prime minister who should be the head of government and a president uh, who really will be more ceremonial. And you and I could understand why Mr. Rollins would not accept being a president with merely ceremonial powers. So he rejected that provision and ultimately uh, we went in for what it is that we have. People have criticized the co co committee of experts for including uh, Article 78.1, that minister's majority should come from parliament. But as I've indicated, they looked at our history and realized that those kind of instability had occurred. And we needed something that would be more acceptable. People have criticized them, but I think that they did a great job because uh, that provision is innovative. But just that in constitution uh, re-engineering, there are always issues. You may want to resolve one issue but it will lead to something else. So that historical context is fully addressed in my paper, that people should understand the inclusion of 78-1 within the historical dynamics and context of Ghana's history. Thank you. All right, let's take another two set from non-historians. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for an exciting uh, you know, discussion. Uh, 
So as I wanted to know, until we had this debate about the constitutional review and the aftermath, I, I didn't really know that Ghana's constitution as it is today, 70% of it is borrowed from the Ukrainian constitution at some point in time. And so my question was, this option we are debating, what is it we can hold in other places as best practices? So that we can say it's because of this that we are, you know, going to, you know, to opt for this. Uh, the other thing was about, I thought we would, uh, I would also hear a bit about our party structures. Because when you are really talking of uh, listening to my other old political scientists, well, Dr. Edu is not here, but over the years we have heard about, you know, new, uh, you know, patrimonialism and, and other things. And my understanding was rewarding people for some loyalty which necessarily doesn't have to be rooted in being chosen as a representative from your area. So I was wondering, looking at how our party system is organized, how the president taking people outside parliament would look like and what the repercussion would be for our democracy. Thank you. Uh, actually, our chair uh, brought up was the idea of democracy as, as hypocrisy. And he's, I think he will speak to that in terms of the Ghana situation. What I wanted to do was bring this up in terms of uh, the U.S. situation. A lot of African countries, uh, we find ourselves modeling ourselves after what we find in the West in the U.S. and in the U.K. without necessarily taking into account uh, some of the challenges with those systems. One of the things, uh, if we look at a U.S. democracy, you have electoral colleges where the president is actually chosen by a select few, and you saw this in some of the past elections in the 2000s where even if the majority gives a popular vote for a specific president, a very small select few can say we reject that and this is who will be president. And even from the inception of this electoral college, some of the founding fathers, quote unquote, said the people are too stupid for us to ever give them the power to make these types of choices. So democracy, and when I say democracy, it's hypocrisy. Malcolm X had a very famous quote where he said, until black people get the types of rights, you know, they talked about second class citizenship, that until there shouldn't be anything called second class citizenship, either you're a citizen or you're not. So he was saying that democracy is hypocrisy until you can show that all of the people have this type of representation. So just saying all of that to say, if we have a very uh, hypocritical system, and then we in turn are trying to model ourselves after those types of systems, what types of challenges you know, would come up or do we actually see in the Ghanaian situation and in other uh, situations as well in Africa? Thank you very much. I will go back a bit because I left the issue of private uh, member uh, uh, bill, uh, private member bill. Um, so, since 1990, uh, the inception of the current constitution among parliamentarians, you know, uh, the exercise of private member bills has not uh, 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 been done. Uh, basically, parliamentarians as lawmakers in Ghana, but they are not the source of law because whenever they want to pass, um, introduce any bill that has financial implication, it will have to go through the executive. So that is the issue about the private uh, member uh, bill. Now, uh, best practices, you know, um, I, I think that the key thing to consider when you are drawing, constructing constitution, doing you know, constitutional re-engineering, or when you are reviewing a, a constitution, uh, should reflect on the values of society. You see, Americans, uh, why is it that they didn't just copy the Westminster from the British? They wanted something that they could, you know, describe as their own, possess it and move with it. And in developing their constitution, they took into consideration the values, you know, of, of their society. To what extent can we say that post-independent Africa, all the constitutions that we have had reflected the values, the culture, and so on and so forth of the people. And I can understand easily why our constitutions are really 
people don't identify with it because it's not just a reflection of our values and our cultures. We just borrow it and say uh, it is America, it is so and so, it's so and so and so forth. But I think there are other cultural values that the 1992 Constitution uh, seeks to introduce. So, um, so for example, the whole concept of having a council of states, you know, and of which about 10 of them, a lot of the appointees are actually uh, chiefs and, uh, you know, prominent chiefs from the National uh, House of Chiefs and so on and so forth and other things, was precisely to draw on some of our history, cultural values and so on and so forth uh, to help it. So even though you have it, the Council of State as it stands now and here, the mandate given to it by the Constitution is purely advisory. You know, so they could just advise the president. He may accept or may not accept it. So I, I would think that you know the inclusion of the Council of State is important because it draws on our historical um, uh, experiences and so on and so forth. But they need probably uh, to be given more powers um, to check on the listing. And because you have your constitution is not based on your values and your culture because you have borrowed it, a lot of your citizens don't identify with it. And the consequences is that you know it's seen as you know somebody's document. And we begin to have some of the challenges that you have. Um yes, so that is also very much linked to uh Obadele's question. Um so in the US, as I indicated, more reflection of their values on their culture. I would love to see Ghana uh, also in this review processes beginning to draw. You know, I, it's not like Sankofa holy, but we could go back to our history, draw on certain things that um, in the past really worked uh, for, for us, and then begin to move with it. Now the excessive powers given to the president, as I indicated, his powers are legion. Patronage powers are so enormous. It's also attributed to our history, where we were told that you know the chief, you know, uh, exercises, you know, was more like an imperial, despotic uh, powers and so on and so forth. So what is actually happening is a perpetuation of you know the old system. Uh, it's something that I think that we need to um, that we need to address. Uh, but also some of the challenges also has to do with the fact that the appointing powers of the president are enormous, you know, ministers, ambassadors, you know, uh, it's street chief executive and so on and so forth, uh, without much, you know, a uh, uh, review process. Even though some of the appointees will have to go through uh, review processes, we know that the review processes uh, has not been strong enough. And then Professor Kui told me just yesterday that um, at the uh, 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 review when uh, they do, uh, when Parliament uh, sits on president nominations, you know, uh, what happened is that if you are a minister, uh, if you are a MP who have been given ministerial appointment, if you appear before the committee, I mean, usually five minutes you are, uh, is done because you are one of us. I think those processes are not really done. We need to tighten up. And scrutinize our uh, appointment uh, quite closely. Well, she joined us. She had to leave for another event, so she asked me to do this on NPL. And I'm going to quote her. I like the notion of selecting majority, if not all, ministers from outside parliament. I'm sympathetic to Dr. Santi's position. However, in a system where there is mistrust of government, many of us would believe that the president will simply select yes men and women as ministers who will simply arrange behind the scene deals with parliament. So would we really have a separation? It may be de jure, but not de facto. Maybe I'm just a snake, and that's a direct anomaly. Maybe I'm just a snake. <laughs> okay, can we take one more question before we address the point of the I think this is a very, very, very important topic. Uh, as a political scientist myself, I think uh, I have a enormous interest in this subject because it touches on the question of uh, institutional development. Mine, I believe, is probably not necessarily a question of questions, but there are a few comments that might help, as is indicated at the beginning, to improve the paper. I believe that for those of us who um, listen to you, it would be great if somewhere 
at the beginning of the paper the historical accounts of how we arrived at the 1992 constitution and especially Article 78, which is the basis of this paper. It will be important if that narrative is given. And since the papers of the Constituent Assembly that drafted the Constitution are still there in the archives, it will be good to look at the various debates that uh, were, uh, were uh, the various issues that uh, constitute the center of the debate and why eventually this arrived. Because as you know, two constitutions prior to the 1992 Constitution that have fusion of powers in the Westminster system of government have fallen. Two constitutions that had the separation of power that you are actually advocating for had also fallen. So some way, somehow, there is a fundamental question of why do we want to return to one of them? Uh, wouldn't it fall at some point in time? So that's my first comment. The, the second comment, so therefore, we need to be guided by history. The, the second comment is um, on the question of values. I believe, going back to the literature by some of the African philosophers, Jechi, Kwame Izirredu, and all those people, will give you a different perspective altogether on the extent to which our values of consociationalism could inform our nature of democracy. And that being the Westminster system or the American system, we probably are just copying things that do not fit into our society. And that as long as we continue to layer those particular uh, institutions on our value system, we are much more likely not to have a fit-fit, but a fit-misfit kind of a, a system. Then, uh, it is important to also advert one's mind to the fact that beyond asking the president to appoint from parliament, the constitution also talks about the need for him to ensure regional and gender balance. I mean, the fundamental question that arises is, should that also be done away with in the interest of merit, or should that be maintained? I mean, so again, if you are calling for that this to be done away with, then it's going to raise the argument of, okay, these are also other provisions that have the same purpose, so they should also uh, go. Now, I think that more importantly, we need to also look at the mathematics of this whole narrative. The uh, members of parliament in, in Ghana today are about 230. Two, 75. I always confuse the districts and the, and the constituencies. Now, out of this, the majority is about 120 thereabouts. The minority is also hanging in there, in there somewhere. The president currently has 28 ministers. Maximum of about 14, 15 are from parliament. The large majority of all these people are not from parliament. How do we come to the conclusion that just by appointing 15 from parliament or 16 from parliament, all of a sudden parliament has been rendered completely inability, unable to, to work? And so that is also something that we need to interrogate. The mathematics of this we need to interrogate. Now, following up from that, I will conclude that you pose a very important question. You are concerned about a very important uh, issue area in political science. However, the answer to the problem probably may lie somewhere else, and not necessarily in the appointment. My, my thinking is that a deeper interrogation may point to the fact that the answer lies in party discipline. We have inherited a historical legacy of a party discipline from the Westminster system. And on top of that, we are practicing a party, uh, an executive presidency that requires weaker party discipline. If you push it further, you realize that you may separate, you may ask the president to appoint completely from outside parliament, but the problem may be much stronger because of party discipline. Thank you very much. I have to run, so please, these are just some comments that we put the paper. Thank you so much. So I want to take uh, director's uh, it was more of a comment, but I want to respond to that. No, she actually asked people who really have the separation. Okay. I can go. I can go over the question. Okay. Super. I like the notion of selecting majority, if not all ministers, from outside parliament. I'm sympathetic to Dr. Santi's position. However, in a system where there is mistrust of government, many of us would believe that the president will simply select yes men and women as ministers, who will simply arrange behind the scenes deals with parliament. So we really have a separation. Maybe a de jure, but not de facto. Okay. Okay, all right. So thank you very much. Um, so that is the challenge with constitutional engineering. Once you want to fix one issue, it generates other, you know, uh, uh, challenges. 
I would never discount the possibility of behind the scenes deals and conspiracies. And I can write, I will show you some, and I, I can assure you that the president is going to have a very, very difficult time should he decide to proceed uh, uh, with Putin. Uh, Honorable Majority Chief with Muntaka Mubarak, uh, I will just say his position is that it is not a practical thing, it is wishful thinking. He is saying that rather than appointing majority from outside, you know, the president should consider appointing all ministers from parliament. Because what is going to happen is that he believes that they, the MPs, spend a lot of time and resources as the president crisscrossed the countryside looking for votes. And after spending this quality time and resources with the president, if he goes out ahead to win, then you are telling him that those that he, who spend the money by virtue that they are in parliament should not enjoy the routine. So already there are people in parliament, his own, the president own people in parliament who are opposed to this. And I can assure you that the president is going to have a difficult time should he decide to appoint all ministers from outside. The parliamentarians will conspire against him and the consequences will be a different ball game. So I, I do not discount that. But at the same time also, these same parliamentarians will have to vet the president, you know, those that he appointed as ministers. And that will, in, in this regard, since as I told you, you know, in parliament today, if any member of parliament is given ministerial appointment, when he appears before the vetting committee, it's done to the five minutes. All that is says that, oh, he's one of us, we know him, so, you know. Uh, but if you are not one of them, like a course, you gather, you spend six hours, six hours, they will grill you. So trust me, we have great brains in our parliament. I've had the opportunity to do interviews there, something like that. But because of the current system, you know, and collective responsibility, you don't talk. So yes, I recognize the conspiracy behind the scenes to make the president uh, powerful. But I think that it's something that is workable, uh, after all. Um, the historical context, as my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Pesa, indicated, um, um, is very important. Um, um, uh, okay, so cabinet, uh, whether there will be misfit or no misfit and so on and so forth are some of the challenges that I think that we need to address. And, but it's important because in my work, I've gone back to look at some of the existing political philosophy, Jechi, you know, Ray Du, um, you know, great works and great minds, you know, um, um, with regards to what they say, because even the whole idea of good governance, that is what I'm talking about, which emphasizes accountability, transparency, you know, and, and so on. So those values, these scholars have clearly indicated that they are not new, but were something that was present in the traditional African political system. Indeed, if they were present, like issues like consensus building, as a scholar, I've always wondered why is it that it's become so difficult among Africans to foster consensus building? Because it is one of the things that she and all those philosophers have indicated existed in the traditional political system. Why is it that today we find it so difficult to do that? So I think that we can go back. I'm not in favor of Sankofa, borrowing you know, uh, an excessive romanticization of Sankofa, but I think that there are still values there that we can draw. And I must also add quickly that the 1992 Constitution really takes into consideration some of those values. Um, but as to the extent to which um, they are enforced and even people are aware of, is quite debatable because there are others who don't see and identif identify with the Constitution. They think that it's an American something or UK something. So we will benefit uh, if we are able to uh, uh, do that. Now, with regards to the issue of, you know, uh, the directive principle of state policies, which says that the president in making appointment and development must ensure, you know, there is gender equity and uh, fair representation and all those things. They are still binding on the president, and I still believe that there is a way that the president can respond to those constitutional provisions which will help our country uh, uh, the more. So by appointing ministers from outside parliament, it doesn't compromise in any way um, the directive principle of state policy chapter 6, which I believe is extremely uh, 
critical. And if you must appoint from those who have been who have won the favor not just of you but of a constituency, that can be a break on the cronyism. So that strikes me as one possible benefit. Um, and there are two factors you didn't mention that strike me as very important in, in setting this question in context. It's hard for me to see how going from 50 cents to no mandated number would make a dramatic difference in the character of executive and judicial uh, power and behavior. Uh, but you do have in Ghana a much, much larger cabinet of ministers than in many other um, polities, more than double the number in the United States, for example. Um, and you also have extraordinarily strong presidential powers uh, on devolving down to the local level. So in Britain and the United States, whether they're modeled or not, and I, I would be the last one to say the United States politics today is a model the world should emulate. We are virtually crippled by, by sectarian political deadlock, uh, gridlock in the United States just now. But nevertheless, the fact that governors of states, mayors of cities, uh, the, the lower levels of government are entirely independent yes. of the national executive strikes me as a strength, and perhaps that's something that should be reconsidered in the Ghanaian context as a way of rebalancing between uh, judicial and executive. Thank you very much. I'm David Hokoma from Calvin College, director of the program here. Thank you, Doctor. I don't know whether you've considered this. It's also in relation to the appointment of you know, parliament approves, vets and approve ministers. The same way, they have this opportunity. It has never been exercised in this for the public. Vote of censure or vote of no confidence. So, in this direction, parliament can pass a vote of censure in a minister, but the final decision lies with the president. How do you, where do you place this? So, thank you very much. I, I will take your question first. That is also part of the contradiction, the ambiguities in our constitution. Clearly it says that our parliament, so as I indicated, um, so let's look elsewhere what happens. Our parliament can impeach, in the US parliament can impeach the president, right, can just uh, kick him out. But president cannot dissolve the parliament. In the UK, also the president, uh, the prime minister, could be kicked out through a vote of censor. And it is very, very powerful vote that they exercise. Uh, here, our constitution says that parliament can use that vote of censor and they can dismiss, you know, or recommend dismissal of a minister of state by two thirds majority. But the contradiction here is that even though parliament could do that, the ultimate power lies with the president. And until the president decides to you know, enforce that provision, parliament labors in vain. So the whole exercise is one of futility. It doesn't help in advancement of constitutionalism, by which I mean power, you know, uh, um, should check countervailing power. Or what James Madison says, ambitions must be made to check ambitions. Uh, with this clause alone, it doesn't work. So at one hand, you think that, and as I demonstrated, our parliament has substantial powers. Really, I just don't understand why is it that they are only able to uh, exercise those powers. But the complications and the, you know, the deceptions, ambiguity, and contradiction within the constitution, and the fact that parliament itself, they have refused or failed to avail themselves to some of those constitutional provisions because of the dynamics in the house, where some people feel that collective responsibility said they have to keep quiet. And others are also becoming opportunists. You know, they are just, you know, uh, who they just want to cut the eye of the president to get some position. So those are the difficult. So the constitution itself is not bad after all. Just that um, there is this um, thing. So um, Prof. Pokemon, very, very interesting. That is one issue that uh, Prof. Gordon and I have been, you know, it's, it's extremely, I find it absolutely preposterous that in Ghana, the president virtually exercises this, you know, vast appointing power at the national level. You know, ambassadors, you know, and even at the local level. The district chief executive, he nominates all that the, the mayor, you know, uh, cover all, all those guys, all that the assemblies actually uh, do is they will have to approve or reject it. 
Now, you know, and sometimes also it has to do with the hypocrisy. When the MPP was in opposition, they touted the election of, you know, DCs, which was welcomed by a majority of people. When they got in, they realized that it was a very tricky, milky area. So they didn't do it. Now the NDC also went into opposition and they played the same politics that, you know, they wanted uh, DC to. Now they are in and they are also playing the same kind of politics. I believe that uh, if, you know, especially at the local level, if the people, you know, as it happens in the US, are given the power to nominate their own representatives, democracy will be better off than. Uh, chief executive, the president sitting in Accra, stretching his leg, his uh, 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 neck to find somebody to you know, appoint that might need somewhere down there is still waiting. So yes, I think that issue will have to be the mayors and those things. He has, to, you know, those powers will have to be taken over by uh, by the people themselves. All right, as time winds out, let me make one or two observations before we close. One of them has to do with the fact that he was focusing on state governance. I just finished your book in that of African traditional leadership, past, present, and future. That's another subject. The dual system of governance in most African countries we have to be a part of this dialogue. Because now you have traditional rulers, or leaders I call them, they have one system of governance, and then the state has another system of government. We are trying to accommodate the traditional leaders and rulers into the state. Uh, how will that work out in this context? That's one observation. The other observation I have to make has to do with this whole idea of what is the best practice in the world. Uh, Osman is left. I was going to suggest this. The best practice, as far as I know, is the practice that is based on human values. And that is the cornerstone of American Constitution. The pursuit, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Those are human values everywhere. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That is Thomas Jefferson's idea that really helped us to create the American Constitution. Second part of best practice is that a Constitution should not be written on stone. The American Constitution has gone through many stages Many stages. When there was a time women could not vote in American in American society, black folks could not vote. It went through a series of constitutional amendments, the Civil Rights Act by Congress, and working collaboration with the judicial system. You cannot leave out the judicial system. That's your guide for your constitution to keep it alive. A constitution has to be alive. It cannot be written up in the archive and say, forget it. I'm amazed. 1992, we have not come to revisit the Ghana Constitution. I, I'm amazed. Uh, it, it, we've got to do something about it. But, but having analyzed all of this, having this nice discussion, where do we go from here? How do we engage the civil society to bring about changes we know taking place all over the world? What was going on in the UK? So now we find out whether Scotland is going to continue to be part of the UK or not. And what would that implication for us as Africans? We're talking about governance, which is very critical to national development. A part of our problem governance in Africa is corruption. There's corruption everywhere, China, US, everywhere. But ours, we have a lion share of corruption. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. And it hurts my brain, it hurts my heart to see somebody spending three or something thousand dollars for rent. What house are you renting? <laughs> anyway, with that, we come to a close and I want to thank you very much for coming and we hope you come next week. Okay? So, my panel, please, uh, where do we move from here? Okay. Uh, please remember the review process has gone very far. As part of the mandate, they are supposed to come uh, out with a bill which ultimately will be and put before a referendum for you and I to vote either yes or no. Now what is going to happen unfortunately is that um, all the key issues will be jumbled together in one document. 
that's unfortunate. So you either go to vote yes or no. You will not be voting on separate issues like this one, where you can. I have, you know, I have my unalloyed support for uh, appointment from all outside. Uh, but unfortunately, you will not have it this way. When you accept yes, it means yes for everything in that document. That document is very, very huge. But in between, I guess you can be part of the conversation and know that constitutional review process is not like an act of the covenant that you, you know, cannot touch. Or when the act is coming, you have to uh, hide your face. So please don't hide your face. Be part of the process. And ultimately, uh, it will advance constitutionalism in this country, political stability, and uh, we'll all be uh, happy people. Thank you. Abu, Abu. All right, uh, I would like to first uh, thank both Dr. Asante for an exciting, thought-provoking, and electrifying presentation, and also our uh, honorable, distinguished, <laughs> and uh, respectable chair, Professor Emeritus, uh, endowed founding from chair, <laughs> Professor uh, Jacob Gordon, for on late notice uh, agreeing to chair this presentation and did quite a good job as well. Uh, I would like to thank everyone for coming out again. We had questions as to even five minutes before the start as to whether we, we would be able to fill up the room. And yes, indeed, we did. We Even people left, and we still have a very good crowd. So, and, and next week, we have another extremely exciting presentation by uh, Professor Irene Odote, uh, entitled From Grio to Archivist. Uh, and she will be detailing the historical role that a real uh, chief linguist, all of these, would play, and how an archivist also is recording history in various forms, in various media, as we are even doing today. You can check the video. The video will be posted on YouTube, um, most likely before Saturday, but it depends on what my workload is. <laughs> uh, and also before it closes, I would like to give a big round of applause to Echo. Chief ITC Assistant Engineer, right honorable as well. All right, so thank you everyone for coming out. Next week it will be here as well, and uh, please be sure to tell a friend. And when you see it online, also be sure to share it. Thank you very much.